there's lots going on in the world nowadays. In general, it's, I think, positive. But in the middle of all of it, there's a lot of, um, a lot of tragedy. I watched a clip this week, <clears throat> extremely powerful. A soldier, a young 22-year-old, fell in Lebanon this week. And I was watching the, um, the father of the boy speaking at the Levaya. And when you watch that, your heart melts. And I don't know. It's a whole different experience when you actually see a father speaking about his son. And the father got up and I only saw a small clip. I don't know what the circumstances were, but he's sitting there. He has a yid with, um, with a big white yarmulke and long payas on his side. And his family is all around him. A lot of kids. His wife's wearing a tichel. And um, his, I guess, older son next to him, also with long bushy payas. And when you listen to them, you get, you get almost like transformed as a being into a whole different type of experience of a Jew. And it's mesmerizing because these guys are the, like the real Jews. They're the real deal. They're not, they're not like faking it, nothing. They live literally. They seem to be living in some issue where it looks like they're not living in, uh, in Brooklyn, you know, surrounded by, uh, I mean, not all the neighbors are great, but they don't want to kill you. And over there they do. And their son went to Lebanon and he fell. So he gets up and he says, he speaks about the good times. My son and I, we used to, we used to dance and we used to, he played guitar and we played all the time and we danced. A whole childhood was one big dance, everywhere. <coughs> and then he says, our holy grandfather, I guess there, said, so I am of the Badechava. The Badechava's yard set was this week, her baby Yitzchak. So he gets up at the Levaya and he starts singing the song of the Baidichiva. You know, and he starts singing and the whole place is singing with him. Hundreds and hundreds of people at the funeral are all singing together with him. And then and then he starts he starts his shyness. His son loved his shyness. And it's a whole different experience of his shyness when he says it. He says, oh, Hoshana, Leman Chai Elokein, Hoshana. And everyone's like, save us, God. And then he starts singing a song. And I'm listening to the song. The song is his shyness. They had a, a tune for Oymani Choyma. And if you listen to the words, it's, it's chilling. Because the words are, you know, the, the his shyness when you go around the bima on every day of Sukkot and then the Shana Rabbah seven times. So you follow the Aleph base each time. And you go through the Aleph base. So there's words like, the hey is, Hoshana haharuga alecha. The one who was killed for you. The vav is, Hoshana v'nechsheves ketsoyim tivcha. Where it looked like sheep to the slaughter. Hoshana is zruya ben machisel, thrown among people who anger us and who hate us. And yet, Hoshana chavuka utvuka bach. We're always attached to you. And to Yenis Ulach, we carry your, your, your yoke. And Hoshana yechida liyachadoch that we have a neshama and our soul is one with you. But we are kvusha bagula. We're conquered, we're stuck in, in, in exile. And then he gets to the shin. And the shin is, hishayna shayagi moishayna hishayna. And the whole entire assembly starts screaming together with him. Hoshana shayagi moishayna. It's a tune, I Hoshana shayagi moishayna hoshana. Those who are screaming and roaring at you, hishayna. And I shine to Muhim Alecha Ishaina, those who are relying on you, Hashem. And when he finishes, he starts the, the, the singing, he starts to speak. And he tells of the night when they heard the, the terrible news. He tells of his kids who were sleeping 
and he says, I was hoping they would sleep some more and not wake up because, you know, and when they woke up, they had to hear the news. And then he says what it was like going to Shachris. Um, and he says he's saying Shachris, and he's looking at the words. I'm not sure if it's before the burial, when it was an Oyen or after, I don't know what it was, but he says, I'm saying the words, and I'm looking at the Akedah. And uh, Avraham Avinu takes his son, and he's about to offer him, and then he doesn't. And he says, and I said, now where is the sheep? Where is the goat? The oil or the carbon is my son. And you listen to these words and they're so full of emuna, and, and it's just so full of, of trusting in Hashem, of belief, of... It's like this is the, the cream, the creme de la creme of the people of Israel. These guys are so plugged in. It's just, it boggles the mind. And the whole conversation, the whole thing he's talking about is how we're going to stay the Simcha and we're going to win this. And all we need is that the people of Israel stay. And, and he's clearly upset at the people of Israel for things that have happened. And then he says, but with Abbas Yisrael to every Jew, we still love you, despite everything. And I'm listening to the whole the whole funeral and I was thinking to myself wow there's Jews who they like they live Judaism the Gemara says in Ksubis that Yisrael should be chutz la'aretz Jews who live in chutz la'aretz watch the words of day avodah zara betaharahim Jews who live in chutz la'aretz are pure idol worshippers Oops. And the Hasidic explanation of it is you could live in Israel and be living in Chutz Laaretz. You could be living in Chutz Laaretz and living in Israel. There's a reason why it's called the state of Israel. Even if we don't believe in the state. It's a state of mind called Israel. And the question is do you live in that state of mind? What state of mind are you experiencing? Because all too often, many people who live in the Holy Land, inside there, live in a space where it's totally not godly. And then there's people like this. You can see the guy is living in a state called Eretz Yisrael. He's living in a state of mind where it's all about Hashem. The whole, the whole thing is about Hashem, including offering a sacrifice of a child who falls in battle to help Jews. And I was wondering, what does it take for all of us to be able to also live in the state called Eretz Yisrael? How do we, living in Chutz Lamez, internalize this message? Last year, when the massacre happened, so you had all these stories about Jews who really were not living in anything called Eretz Yisrael. They were the furthest removed from Eretz Yisrael. They like to call themselves Israeli and not Jewish. Even though Israeli, Yisrael, is actually more Jewish than, uh, than being a Jew. Because Jew is Yehuda. And Yisrael is a quality of a Jew. It means that you have Hashem as a prince in you, Sar Kel. But it's become like synonymous with being, you know, Israeli, disconnected. And then when the war comes about, you know, you have countless of these stories where a guy is a kibbutznik and he's, he's in there with his family and, and then they're stuck inside. And then the, the wife and kids, she says, I'm getting out of here because we're being burnt alive in this uh, mamad, in this little room. And he says, before you get out, let me just go, you know, let me go take my gun and see what I can do. And so he walks out and as he walks out, he hears Hebrew. And it's real Hebrew. And so he's like, he knows that this is um, our guys. But he also knows he gets shot now because he looks like a terrorist. So how do you not get shot? So he's like, he's a kibbutznik. And he's like, what do you do? What do you do? Well, there's one line you could use that everyone knows. And he's like, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokein Hashem Echad. And that's the code, which somehow the other side doesn't get it. They can't say it with the same way a Jew can say it. Even a Jew doesn't know anything about Judaism. 
Inside of us, everyone's got an neshama, a very, very, very powerful soul. The question is whether or not we can live with us and whether we can be Jews. So what does it mean to be Jewish? You know, there's something called Jewish. Mm. Sort of. To be a Jew, you could live in Chutz Laaretz also. You could. You could be a Jew who lives outside the land of Israel, and yet you're an inspired, connected Jew. But, but here's the story. Most of us living over here don't know what it means to have a son in Lebanon. We just don't get it. We don't get what a mother, what a mother feels when her son is on the battlefield and what it's like to have sleepless nights. We don't get what it's like to have true, real Messias Nefesh. The real deal. And we hear about it and it's like, uh, yeah, but it's not nearly the same. It's not nearly as real. And yet, the goal of those soldiers on the front lines is very simple. They're fighting for us. And what does it mean for us? For us to be Jews. So the goal is for each and every one of us to internalize and become a Jew in our lives. And that's why they're fighting. So in other words, if you're living a normal good life, that's good. It's not to feel guilty. It's to feel good. That's the whole purpose of this war and of winning. But what we want to do is not live a life that is void of meaning. A life that you're a Jew deep inside, but on the outside you're just like anyone else. And that's the question. I had in my sukkah a young man, and he comes from a religious family. Such a sweet, sweet, sweet young boy. Really, really sweet. And we were talking, and he tells me, you know, he goes to AA. And he says, I have a sponsor. And the sponsor is, uh, is actually a Christian guy. And he's so connected. Everything's about God. He says, you talk to the guy and everything, the whole conversation is about Hashem. He says, I don't like Hashem. I talk about God. I have PTSD from Hashem. Growing up, you know, the way I did. But God, yeah, okay. I said, good, talk about God. No problem. So he says, but you know something? I told my sponsor, and he says, me, I've got a problem. Every time Shabbos comes in, I feel guilty. Like I have to keep Shabbos, and I don't. And every morning I get up, I feel guilty. Why can't I just be like my sponsor, who's such a holy guy? But he comes home on Saturday afternoon, and he goes and watches a movie. And he's okay with watching the movie and there's nothing guilty about it. And I, every time I watch a movie on Saturday, I feel guilty because it's Shabbat. And his question was, how do I get rid of that guilt? <laughs> and we had a whole conversation. I don't think I got through to him yet. Hopefully we will still. But you know what the answer is? When you're watching a movie, the movie is not about Hashem. It's not about God. The movie takes you into a whole different arena. If you want to live with God, not just inside, but outside, and your whole life becomes godly, oh, that's what we want to do. We don't want to impose guilt nor doing things. Perimitzvahs are designed to expose the true you. When you do it correctly, it's designed to bring out who you truly are. And it's just a bit of a sad notion that too often we, we present Terumitsus as a chore, as another problem in your life, instead of realizing how just glorious it is, because it's discovering of your own neshama, of your own soul. And when we align ourselves with being a Jew, which means there's... There's me inside. I have an neshama inside of me. There's the external me, which is that if you're a religious Jew, you keep Torah and mitzvahs. The question is how to bind the two together so that the Torah and mitzvahs that you do stem from the Jew that you are and you can blend the two together and make it into one. 
This week we read a special Haftarah because it's uh, Shabbat Rosh Chodesh. On Rosh Chodesh, every Rosh Chodesh. What we read is Yeshayahu Anavi. Yeshayahu says, he says, Ko Amar Hashem, Hashamayim Kisi v'ha'aretz adom raglayim. The heavens are my throne and the earth is my footstool. What home can you build for me? He's talking about the Beis HaMikdash. You think that I need the Beis HaMikdash? The heavens and earth are mine. I don't need anything from you. What do I need? I look at someone who is real and who cares and who's actually trembling from my word. That's who Hashem is interested in. That's the opening of the Haftar. Every Rosh Chodesh, something unique transpires. We have a sun and a moon, and the moon has no light of its own. And what happens is, the moon gets close to the sun in order to get its light. So really, what you have is, right, the lunar month, which is a month we follow in Judaism, the lunar month gets from the sun. What happens is, on the 15th of the month, any month, you'll see the moon at its wholesomeness. What happens to the moon on the first of the month? It doesn't exist. It appears as if that's called a new moon, right? The Rosh Chodesh is the Molad, the new moon. Every Rosh Chodesh, the moon disappears. The moon is not disappearing on Rosh Chodesh. It's actually quite the contrary. The moon is so close to the sun that you don't see his own personality. So the sun is here, the moon goes away from the sun. That's where you see the light of the sun. When you're seeing the light on the 15th day of the month, that's because he's far from the sun, so he's projecting his own light. When he's on the first of the month, he's close to the sun, so you can't see his own light. And every one of us, we are compared to the moon. Israel domina levana. Why we like the moon? Because Hashem wants us to shine. He wants us to go into our own space and shine. But every Rosh Chodesh, he says, come back home here. Come here. Let's be together. And the moon is not shining because the sun is shining. If the sun is Hashem and the moon is us, what happens on Rosh Chodesh is you let go and you let Hashem run your life. So there's this moment of Rosh Chodesh, which is I get into a space, a zone of letting go. Totally. And don't let go and then do nothing. Let go and then do massive action. That's the 15th of the month where you go out and shine. But not for too long. Come back home and get some power. And that's what Hashem says in the beginning of the after of Shabbat Rosh Chodesh, El Zeabit El Ani Unechei Ruach. I'm looking at someone who's humble. That's a Jew who lets go. In this verse is expressed the life of how a Jew can live as a Jew. Because what happens is that our, our world is a dark world. There's so much darkness going on. There's just so much craziness going on. And what you're expected to do in the middle of it all is walk right into it and be a Jew, stand your ground, stand firm, let go, let Hashem be projected through you. Because that's what you are, a divine being. And the most critical part of being a divine being is recognizing that. Because you are a divine being, the whole world knows that, the world senses that. The problem is, we don't sense that. And we are not necessarily plugged in to who we are. And when we get plugged in, something phenomenal transpires. It's really what's happening in, uh, in the world today. And it's, um, it's gratifying and uh, incredible to watch. Where you have, you know, like Mamish, the whole world gangs up against us. Literally, everybody's against us, America included, all too often. And they gang up against us. And, um, and our mission is to ask one question. What does the Torah say? What does Hashem say to do? And rest assured, if you follow what Hashem says, the rest of it will fall away. And for decades, for decades, we followed, a, uh, Israel followed a line of thinking, which is, let's, let's allow the world, right? Allow the world to control us. I was having a conversation with someone about, you know, about the Israeli flag. Like, are you behind the Israeli flag? Would you hold up the Israeli flag? And I said to him, no, I wouldn't. 
I would never take it down. But no, I wouldn't hold the Israeli flag. Because you know what the Israeli flag says? It says that the United Nations can tell us what to do. Because the Israeli flag was made in November 1947, really, by a United Nations resolution. If it was made by a United Nations resolution, then it can also be undone by a United Nations resolution. And let's get this straight. We're not here because of the United Nations, and the land is not ours because of the United Nations. It's ours because it's ours. But now, to actually say that in the world is really hard. But this week, amazing. The entire Knesset voted together, all sides, to kick out the United Nations out of Israel. And then the whole world is mad and angry and mishuga. Someone once came, one of the politicians in Israel, you can watch it on, on a video, he comes into the Lubavitcher Rebbe and he says, but Rebbe, don't we have to worry about what the world thinks? Like, you can't have the whole world tell you that they'll kick you out of the United Nations and what happens, when, you know? The trouble is, you know that the United Nations, they are the terrorists. It's not like, they're not, they are the ones. So what should we do? Let them in? But when you think about it logically, yeah, you have no choice. What can you do? When you think like a Jew, and the rabbi tells him, he says, I come from Russia. In Russia, he says, we had these things called blood libels. The definition of a blood libel is that you make up whatever you want. So the Cossack, the Goy, will make up against you whatever he wants, whether you do this or that. He will have the same agenda. And since he's going to have the same agenda, why would you follow his agenda and succumb to it? Try the opposite. Try follow what Hashem says to do. And what does Hashem say to do? Prime Minister of Israel said it in such a beautiful way. He said the wrong line, but it was still very nice. He said, Hakam hashkem leogo. If someone wants to kill you, kill him. And then tell the President of the United States and France that you did it. Oh, sorry, you were against it? I didn't realize. I'm sorry. That's how you operate. First you do, and then you start worrying about it. That means you have to deal with all pressures and stresses that come to you from all angles, and you have to stand your ground firmly and say, I am with Hashem. That's what the Navi is saying to each and every one of us. Ko amar Hashem. Hashemayim kisi. So said Hashem, the heavens are my throne, ve'aretz adom raglai, and the earth is my footstool. You want to build a home for me? El zeabit, I look to ani unechei ruach. Someone who is humble. The definition of humble is, what does God want, and am I expressing what Hashem wants? But to do this requires a lot of hard work. It's like, it's very nice to say, okay, I'm going to do it. You know what the problem is? If the enemies of the United Nations, mele, we can deal with them. The problem with the United Nations is that they're not just living in the United Nations. They're living inside your head also. The problem is that the enemies stem from here and here. And so what you'll discover is that the fears and stresses and anxieties and worries are all inside. And so it's very nice that I can deal with the outside enemy, but how do I deal with my own internal enemy? So powerful how we say every night in Mayriv. Kiga'al Hashem et Yaakov, what's the word there? Hashem, 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 Malchotcha, Rubanech, Bukhan, Hashem, 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 and enemies on the inside. If we learn how to do it, we can overcome the enemy inside, outside, everywhere. That's about be a Jew. Be a Jew and let go with Hashem. Every morning we daven. And davening is downloading that energy of how to do it. The world exists on two planes. Everything that's happening to you in your life at any point in time happens on two planes. I love that, the, the hologram when you look at, you know the holograms, you look at whatever it's called, those things, you look like at a picture and you see this mumble jumble like whatever and you have to put your nose on it and you have to look and like eye like that and look backwards and forwards until you unfocus and your eye focuses on, the, on something else and then you start seeing this whole massive image behind it. Ever see those things? 
It's phenomenal because then you see behind it this incredible image. The world is like that. The whole world is a dark place because you're looking at it from eyes of darkness. If you flip the eyes, the world becomes a bright light. And what you want to do is learn how to do that, to do that in real time. We have a force called Bina. Women have extra Bina. Bina Yaseira Nitna Beisha. Women have extra Bina. What's Bina? So a man is Chochmah and a woman is Bina. Bina is called Leavin Davar Mitoch Davar. And that means to understand one thing from another. But then it should have said Leavin Davar Midavar. It says Leavin Davar Mitoch Davar. The answer to every single question you have and how to understand it correctly is by understanding the thing you want to understand from inside the other one. And that means every problem you have is not a problem. It, in itself, is the solution. So never look to solve the problem. Look to mm, enjoy the problem. To look at the problem in a whole new way. That's called being Jewish and revealing it. When we start davening, well, somewhere in the middle actually, we say the bracha of Avinu Avarachaman. Merciful Father, Achim Aleinu, have compassion over us. What's the compassion? The ten belibeinu bina leavin uleaskil lishmoa lilmod lelamed lishmoa v'lasot. What does that mean? Give us the power to understand. You have to ask Hashem for bina. Almighty God, please help me. I'm stuck. I live in the darkness. And what I'm asking you for is to be able to see light in my life. How do I see light? Not by doing anything else other than flipping the conversation and seeing the light in this moment. But if you don't ask Hashem for help every day, you won't get it. Because don't take it for granted that you can see light. La vin davar mitoch davar is a... It's, it's a miraculous way of living. And God's not looking for miracles. <coughs> He's looking for you to live a miraculous life in the natural world. After you ask for the bracha, you say the actual words, right? The affirmation of what it means to be a Jew. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokein Hashem Echad. Such deep words. Let's decode them in a unique way. Shema Yisrael. Shema means to listen means use your intellect. Shema is to dare hair, to understand, to work through, to get it. The reality that this world is not what you see. What it is, is Hashem a God, Hashem is Echad. Not one God, one, nothing else. Whatever's happening to you now is happening to you from Hashem. Right from Hashem. So the foundation of it is actually in this week's Tanya in the the daily Tanya that's being learned. There's a story about Shimi ben Geira who comes out and curses King David. And he's cursing him. And David Amela feels so broken from this curse because he's running away from his son of Shalom and he feels broken. And one of David's men, Abishai, says, let me just knock his head off. Chutzpah, the guy's against the king. And David says, no. Why? He's not doing the cursing. Ki Hashem amar lo kalel. God is doing the cursing. Whatever's happening in your life, right? Whatever is going on, anything that's happening, the key is to see that it's not happening from that person or that thing. It's happening from Hashem. And you say, why is Hashem doing bad things to me? He never does bad things to you. All Hashem wants is that you should see Him in the moment. And when you do, watch how the situation changes. So this involves a, it's, it's a totally different way of thinking. We're obviously very into this whole idea and all our discussions here, but it's a question of how do we activate this, right? Because all of us have a hard time in reality. And when you're like, it's almost like you've got to go back to the drawing board every time to understand, so what, we, what are we doing here? What am I doing here? And what am I trying to solve? And when it happens in real time, it doesn't look this way. It looks like there's a problem and I've got to solve this problem. And how am I going to solve it? In case you didn't realize you don't know how to solve any problems. What you want to do is solve how you feel about the problem. And then solve the problem. Never solve the problem by trying to solve the problem. A guy told me he has uh, an older kid. And the kid needs to go to work. 
and he's not going to work. He's already an adult, and he's not going to work. So he told me, I'm going to have a conversation with him, and I'm going to tell him today that, uh, that I can't support you anymore, and get, get out of here, and go work. And I said to him, and how do you think that's going to go through? I said, if you ask me what's going to happen is, that's going to cause him to not work more than to work. And you know why that is? Because you're stressed out about him not working and not having a shiva. And therefore, what you're going to communicate is, you loser, go work. When you communicate to your child that you're a loser, the child doesn't know how to work. They become, if you have any real connection to them, which a father usually does, they become, they feel like a doormat. Doormats can't go work. He says, what should I do? I said, try this. Before you go out and talk to your son, just think about him. Put him in the light. Look at your son and say, just think of a big light. Or Chodesh al Look at your son in a big light. Look at him as the most successful person that he is. He's like, successful? A loser he is, my kid. Is he? What does Hashem think about your son? Hashem thinks about him. That he's a neshama, he's a chelik elikam and mal mamish. He put on film this morning. He did a mitzvah also. Hashem thinks he's awesome. Think about him the way Hashem thinks about him and get into that zone. And when you do, he says, then what, I shouldn't tell him to go work? No. Well, then when you speak to him, he will sense that you're energizing and empowering him. Now it doesn't make a difference what you'll say. It's like, oh, so, okay, he's thinking about it. So I'll go over to him and... I'll tell him how awesome he is and that he's so great. I need his help because I can't afford to, um, to, you know, to support him all the time. And therefore, can he help me? I said, that's a good start. You, you help me, not I help you. If you energize the people around you and you believe in them and you see things in a new light, they will change. Because what you want to do is see the glorious godliness of the moment. Here's what happens to us. We get stuck in, the world is just a bunch of emotions that we get stuck in. Imagine you didn't have emotions. Wouldn't that be fun? <laughs> if you didn't get frazzled all the time and feel anxieties, etc. You just had this moment, just everything's whatever's going to be done. You just do it. And without the emotion. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Apparently it would. It would be so good. We just do what we want to do without getting all the time caught up. Because all the fights happen because get, we get caught up. You walk home, you're frustrated. Within a minute, the whole house is frustrated. Now, where did that come from? It came from you. Because you walked in that way. How do you change that space? So Hashem tells us, emotions aren't bad. They're actually very good. You just need to take the energy and the core of what they are and strip them of their external reality. We have seven emotions, right? The Sheva Midot. Hashem, let's think about him with the seven big emotions. That's why it's 70. Ayin is 70. Shema is Shem Ayin. Ayin is 70, the numerical value. And the Shem, a name of Ayin. It means a little slither of the 70 emotions is what you get. Meaning like this. All emotions come from Hashem. We say it in davening, Lecha Hashem Magdullah Vagbura Vatif Eret Vanitzach Vahodi. To you, Hashem, all emotions are yours. When you give over your emotion to Hashem, what you'll discover is that emotions are just designed to push you in a direction and to get you moving into a place. Because if you don't feel any anxiety over not having money, you probably won't make or make any money. But when you have an anxiety, you can't make any money because now you feel anxiety. But anxiety is not anxiety, it's actually excitement. It's a motivating force to guide you in a particular direction. So what we want to do is be able to take the emotion, to feel the externality of the emotion, to feel the intensity of it, and then strip him of his energy and just make it divine energy. And this takes hard work. But imagine you could do this. Imagine every time you feel a strong surge of anxiety. You don't allow, right? Anxiety says, go do that. 
and you don't listen to what he says to do. You just say, one second, what am I feeling? So anxiety is saying, my kid has no parnasa, he doesn't make any money, what should I do? Go talk to him. Don't go talk to him. Because the anxiety said to talk to him. And therefore the conversation will be anxiety ridden. That's why we lose the conversations. Don't talk to him. Rather, what should you do? Change the emotion. And then decide if you want to talk to him. The conversation will be a different conversation. This doesn't mean you shouldn't do action. We should do action. But before we do action, it's about get into a good space yourself. That's the basis of tracht gut für sein gut. When you're thinking good and you're feeling good about yourself, goodness happens all around you. And when you're frazzled, it's horrible. But it's not bad to be frazzled. It's good. Because that's how you know which direction to go in. If you didn't have those emotions, how would you know which direction to go in? So is it bad to have these emotions? No, it's awesome. It's great. And what you want to do is have them and then flip them. How do you flip them? Quite simple. When you cry it out, you feel good. Just sit there in whatever emotion you're feeling. And yes, when, when it happens, you're not thinking about this. And you're like, oh, oh, one second. That's it. This is the thing. What am I feeling right now? And sit there in that feeling and just notice how you're feeling this anxiety. Just sit there for five minutes, however long it takes. So you're like, you wonder, do I, I don't have time for this. You don't have time not to do this. And once you let that go, now you're like, and, yes, and, and I'm feeling anxious, and Hashem is giving it to me. That's the basis of the Jewish affirmation. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Eleke, and Hashem Echad. It means, I have an anxiety. That's what I'm walking in with. I try doing this, by the way. Whenever I say Shema, before I close my eyes, I close. There's, an, oh, there's a moment of closing. And then I'm thinking, do I feel any anxiety right now or something? And if I do, I say, okay, yeah, 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 that's it, fine. Okay, this is an anxiety. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokein Hashem Echad, it's all Hashem. And the Shem Ayin is, it's a little name of the 70, the big midas of Hashem, the big emotions. It's being downloaded into me. And why is it being downloaded into me? For one simple purpose. Be'ahavta et Hashem Elokecha. Note these words because it's so powerful. We translate it as you should love Hashem your God. Right? Be'ahavta doesn't mean to love. I don't know what love means in, at all. But ava is to desire. Right? And it doesn't say ve'avita et Hashem Elokecha. You should desire Hashem your God. Be'ahavta is to cause Hashem to be desired. Be'ahavta ve'ihavta. Right? In dicto, in grammar, to cause him to be beloved. So think about it this way. My mission is, Be'ahavta et Hashem to become Elokecha. Hashem is God, miraculous. Elokecha is Hashem as it comes down to nature. My mission in life is, to make Hashem desired by me. That means, you never need to know in life, more than one single solitary step ahead. Don't ever try to go two steps ahead, let alone 10 steps. So you say, but how am I going to plan? It's very simple. When you don't know where you're going, you don't know what you're doing, the next step is to make a plan. That's the next step. So make a plan. After you have a plan, kill the plan and drop it. Now you know which direction to go in. So let's say you're young and you want to find the shidduch. So it's like, okay, now's the time to go find the shidduch. So what am I doing now? I'm going to find a shidduch. So you decide, I'm going to find the shidduch. Now destroy it. Who cares? I do find, I don't find. I don't care whether I find the shidduch or not. I'm going in that direction. I'm going to find my child the shidduch. So now I know what to do. Call the shadchan. And go on dates. And do what you're going to do. And don't worry about the actual shidduch coming about. Because when you worry about the outcome, you're worrying two steps ahead. And outcome won't get you anywhere. So it's direction, and then you move one step ahead. That's what it means. If Hashem Elokein Hashem Echad, then it means God's running the world and not me. Ve'ahavta et Hashem, I want Hashem, I desire that Hashem should become my God. That means I'm letting go, I'm letting Hashem run the world. The thing about Hashem is, He runs the world anyway. But He tells you, if you don't let me run the world and you don't accept that I'm running the world, then you will be jumping up and down, frazzled and going crazy, 
because you're not letting me run the world. Because Hashem says, I need you to be my representative on earth. You are my throne. A king has a throne. And he sits on his throne, and that's where he's expressed. What's Hashem's throne? We say the words, Ve'ata kadosh, yoshev te'ilot Israel. You know what that means? You're holy, and you sit on the praises of Israel. Here's the deeper meaning. Holy is removed. Ve'ata kadosh. You're up there. What makes you not kadosh, but yoshev, to sit down, which is you're standing up and you come down, the answer is Tehilot Yisrael. When a Yid praises you. Tehila means not just to praise, to get excited, ignited. Hilo. Fire. When a Jew is on fire with Hashem, that brings Hashem down. So, it's so counting to it. But here's how we try it. Whenever you're having an emotion, that's a fire. A fire against Hashem. Because you're excited in a negative way. Anxious. What you want to do is watch that anxiety in you. Oh, there's a foreign fire going on inside me. And look at yourself and have a, just joke around. Have fun. And then you say, close my eyes. I'm feeling this. Anxious. Shema Yisrael Hashem. Hashem is one. There's nothing besides Hashem. Okay, so it's all really from Hashem. Talk to yourself and let yourself realize it. Remember, you already asked Hashem for, for a request. Hashem, help me. Rachem aleinu. And allow me, Bina, to be able to see behind what's going on. And what's my goal? I'm going to bring Hashem. I'm going to desire that Hashem should become my God. What does it mean to make Hashem into your God? Of course it means to keep Shabbos and to uh, keep kosher, etc. It also means to feel joy every moment. So you're with your spouse and the spouse knocks you down and makes you feel like a piece of dirt. That happens sometimes. And what are you doing? You feel broken. Change that. What does it mean, change that? I feel broken. It's hard. Yeah, it's hard. And what? I feel like a piece of dirt. You know what? It's hard. I actually am a piece of dirt. That's where humans come to and where they go, go to. And it's good. It's great. That means I don't have any worries. And accept it and watch how once you... It's this part like automatic. Once you accept it, it's okay. I'm feeling like that. Yeah, and a few moments later, it'll go away. And you avoided the fight. What you want is to make Hashem into your God and not the other person every time. Not the other experience. Or, if you're a Prime Minister of Israel, the God is not the President of France or America or the United Nations. God is Hashem. And you ask, what does God want? And you follow that. And you allow your cue to come from Hashem. V'avdet Hashem to become Elokecha. Says Hashem, Hashemayim kisi. My throne, where do I sit? Is Shamayim. Shamayim is heavens. Shamayim is a Jew who lives in the heavens. Shamayim is a Jew who's acting on his godly divine powers. And he, he lives his life with joy. Because every moment he's revealing Hashem. Yoshev allows Hashem to sit on the throne. Hashem wants to be on the throne. The problem is that we're just beings trying to get along in life. And Hashem's saying, no, you're my throne. I want to sit on you. Live with heaven. Live with Hashem in your life and you watch how your life will change. And then there's a footstool, Hashem says, I have to put my feet up. What does it mean, Hashem's feet? Hashem doesn't have a body. He doesn't have feet. But the feet are, like, you know, when Moshe Rabbein goes up the mountain, so he was learning with Hashem. And then the Jews down here on earth sinned. And they made the golden calf. And Hashem says, Lech red, ki go down, because your people have messed up. And so the head falls when the feet fall. Because the head and the feet are aligned. Hashem says, I need you to have a great head space. I also need you to have action. What does it mean, action? It means it's about how you feel and then about how you act. You are a walking space of Hashem. Every Rosh Chodesh, we get to the zone with Hashem, close to Hashem. Every moment of our lives, we have that. Hashem says, come close and go out and reveal it. 
What does it mean to come close? Stop worrying. When you're worried about the future of the people of Israel, and the future of your family, and what's going to be in the next minute and everything, stop worrying. Just have a direction to go in and then watch the feeling that's happening and let it go to Hashem Elokein Hashem Echad to see the world behind the world. And you know, what's my mission? I'm going to bring Hashem to become my God in this moment, in the next moment, in the next moment. But what's going to be with life? What's going to happen? Oh, you're feeling anxious, aren't you? And if you go one step at a time, you watch how life unfolds with all your dreams being revealed in Hashem's way. It's just so hard for us to do it because, because we don't really believe it. And it's hard for us to do this. But Hashem says, El zeabit, el aniu ruach. You want to build a home for me? You want to make me live inside you? Because every Jew is a mikdash, a home of Hashem. It's built by a Jew who davens to Hashem. And when he davens to Hashem, he recognizes the power of Hashem in his life. And I ask Hashem for help to be able to understand, to see the world behind. And then he meets the emotions, those 70 powerful emotions every time, the Shem Ayin, and he recognizes that, oh, that's an emotion, it's hard. I'm going to bring Hashem to become my God. And Hashem says, oh, there is where I live, inside you. You and I are one. And then you activate it in the life of doing mitzvahs. When a Jew gives tzedakah, tzedakah, it picks you up, it elevates you. When a Jew does mitzvahs, that means your actions are aligned with your words. So it's not saying to be to have feelings and non-actions. No, have massive action. But to live in a space of, I daven, I do Torah, I do mitzvahs, that's a Jew who has Hashem in his lifetime. I saw a beautiful episode that took place in 1984, I think it was. Rabbi Moshe Mary Lifshitz was a shliach. He lived in uh, Alabama. And um, so he used to travel there was a, a, maximum, a, a minimum security prison. It was called Maxwell Federal Security Prison. And um, it was for white-collar criminals. And it was in um, Montgomery, Alabama. So he would travel from Birmingham, Alabama, every Yontiv to Montgomery. And uh, one time it was a long three-day Yontiv, Rosh Hashanah. He goes with his family, and they're spending a three-day Yom Tov of Rosh Hashanah on, uh, on the ground. Not easy to do that, you know, and there's only 15 Jews, and they don't know anything about Judaism. But they, Rosh Hashanah, so he's here for them, for three days. Anyway, spending time with them, and um, then Yom Kippur comes back. On Yom Kippur, before Neila, he gets up, and he gives a, a speech. I actually spoke about this in Shul, also before Neila. Figured it was a good moment to do so. But before Ne'ilah, he gets up and he says, he says, um, you know, Ne'ilah is a time when the doors are locked and Hashem is not outside, but you're inside, you and Hashem together. And therefore, it's an appropriate time to take on a resolution. Take on a resolution and Hashem, you know, will give you something from it. Take on a mitzvah. And that's a powerful moment to express the love of Hashem. So he says, let's take two minutes and think of a mitzvah. And then he himself thinks of a mitzvah also. And all the inmates think of their own mitzvahs. And then it's wonderful. And that's it. After Ne'ilah, it's over, and they're having the breaking of the fast. So um, one of the inmates, a fellow by the name of Carl, comes over to the rabbi, and he says, Rabbi, I took on myself a mitzvah of keeping um, Shabbos. Never kept Shabbos. He says, you know, that's a big one. That's really hard. He says, yeah, but I didn't know when, when you said a mitzvah. I don't know any other mitzvahs. The only mitzvah I know about is Shabbos. So I did Shabbos. He said, you can change it if you want. I'll give you an easier one right now. And then you can start with that. Maybe it's not a good to start. He said, no, no, no. Whatever I took on, that's what I do. So could you guide me how to keep Shabbos? He says, um, yeah. So he gives him the basics. And then um, he said, I'll get you a book. Next time he comes over, he brought him a book by Rabbi Shimon Ida, which was the only English book really available at the time on how to keep Shabbos. So he brought him the book. And the guy takes the book. Carl takes the book. And he starts to read it. And every time he's asking about my questions over the next couple of weeks. After a few weeks, he notices that um, there's a Tuesday night shear every week. After Tishrei, um, you know, they have a Friday night. They was there on Friday night. It was very nice. They were dancing together. Carl's asking all sorts of questions. 
The next week he wasn't at the class on Tuesday night, the next week not either, for a couple of weeks he wasn't there and he asked the other guys, where's Carl? And I said, oh, Carl, um, he was released. It's like, what? It's meant to spend a little while here still. He says, no, no, Rabbi, what he did was this. He basically, um, he read the book and in the book he read that it says there that if you keep two Shabbosim, then you get released. Right, it says that the Jews keep two Shabbos, Hashem frees them. So he said, okay, so I'm going to do it. So I, I'm in prison, so I'm going to keep two Shabbosim. But he didn't know how to keep Shabbos. So he read, he stayed up four nights. And he read the entire book, and he learned the whole Hilcha Shabbos to keep it. And he kept it. And after the second Shabbos, they came to him and they told him that um, he's released. Because there was some uh, government program that allows people like him to be released. And he went home. He's like, a few weeks later, when he was allowed to call calls me up and he's, he came over for Lachaim and he's a Jew, keeps Shabbos now. He's like, that was amazing. Yeah, because he actually believed it. <laughs> because most people read that, they get, oh, it doesn't mean that. But Carl took it for real as to what it means. And when we're Jews and we want to live our life like a Jew, Hashem allows us to live life like a Jew. But what does it mean to be a Jew? It means to be a Jew. To be a Jew is hard work. And it's such fun. It's about watching Hashem and the joy of the moment, of every moment. And when we do, then we also can be a little bit of those Jews in Lebanon because they're fighting and dying for Judaism so that we can live for Judaism. And what does it mean to live for Judaism? It means to live Hashem Echad every moment of our lives, to live with the power of Hashem for real.